Well, here in Oklahoma, we live in a land of big oil and big ag, two sectors of our economy whose rise and fall have in my lifetime been inextricably linked. If you will, take a look at this chart with me that goes all the way back to the 1960s. Now this blue line is energy, while the red, it's agriculture. And what you see is that both sectors, well, they stayed pretty depressed and pretty flat up and through the mid-1970s when both, well, they both started to tick up. Now, what seemed like a dramatic rise then was in fact pretty stable, even within the normal rises and falls you'll see in most cyclical markets. That is, until we got right here in the early 2000s when both agriculture and energy, well, those prices, they just shot through the roof. Agriculture, not quite as high as oil, but still at historic levels. And then here comes the financial crisis that started with our banks and then spread globally. And prices, well, they just nosedived and they've not been the same since. At this year's Rural Economic Outlook Conference, I sat down with the Senior Director of Industry Research for the Knowledge Exchange Division of CoBank, Terry Barr, and had him explain why many of the same factors that drove growth in the last decade have now reversed. So Terry, to understand our agricultural economy, we really need to look at the domestic economy and probably even more so the global economy. Where do we sit right now? Well, I think what we're, where we're sitting right now is we're seeing a, a great deal of softness on the global economy. The U.S. economy, from the consumer standpoint, is pretty resilient at this point. It's not outstanding, but it's pretty solid in terms of demand. Uh, the problem is on the global side, where we're just not seeing growth in demand. And, uh, you know, we're not seeing a collapse in demand. But as agriculture begins to expand production, as we're getting better yields, record yields, we're talking about record corn crops and so forth, uh, you need growing demand to absorb that. And, and we're just not seeing it. And I think that's the problem. When you look around the globe, you've got a lot of issues that probably suggest that we're not going to have a breakout on the demand side. Um, there's just too many, whether it's Brexit in Europe, whether it's elections in France and Germany, whether it's a restructuring the Chinese economy, all of those things don't suggest to me that you're really going to see this real breakout on the demand side. So now the question is, how quickly does the supply side adjust? Mother Nature gets to be the driver here. Uh, and that's, you know, ag doesn't completely control how much production is going to occur. And we saw that in the wheat industry where we cut acreage and still ended up with a record crop. So, so Mother Nature gets to be much more in control of the environment going forward because of the soft demand growth that's out there. Mm -hmm. and, and I really want to have you go back and talk to me just a bit about the Chinese economy where the growth has slowed considerably and also those developing nations, those, those BRIC countries. Well, again, when you look at China, you know, we used to talk about China, it was double digit growth. That was really kind of on and on. And now we're looking at an economy growing about 6%. Now, we'd love to have 6% growth in the US, but for them, that's half the growth rate that we had before. Their middle class is not rising as rapidly. That's really what drives demand for agricultural products, particularly on the animal protein side. That's just not materializing. They're trying to restructure their economy. They want an economy driven by the consumer, not by investment in state-owned enterprises. Uh, in exports. They realize that's, a, that's not a long-term optimum solution. So that's where they're going. They're not going to change that pattern. That's part of their 10-year plan. Uh, they're on a steady course. And so I think we have to expect that that's really what we're going to get. When you look at around the other countries, you, you, the, the BRIC terminology, we used to talk about Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, these were the new catalysts for global growth and so forth. Now you look at those catalysts and you find a subdued China. You find Brazil in the second year of a recession uh, with you know, major structural issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, you look at India, pretty steady growth in India. There's not really been much deterioration in India, but it's not a very open economy. They don't really allow much access as far as agricultural products go, so they can't be the driver for us. And then you have Russia, which of course is imploding with regard to the energy prices. Uh, they're much more focused on uh, external activities on the military side than they are with regard to their economy. And so their economy has really collapsed, their currency has collapsed. Uh, not much optimism with regard to Russia, I think, in terms of going forward. So that doesn't leave us with much in terms of looking at uh, where are we going to find demand on the emerging markets. Uh, it's, it's a much softer situation than we would have thought two or three years ago. 
Uh, and I think what we're seeing is all of these countries have structural problems that they need to address, and it's simply going to take time. Now let, let's pivot to the domestic market. I've heard the U.S. economy described as the tallest pygmy in that while we're doing better than everyone else, we're certainly not where we ought to be. Right, yeah, we're the best of the worst. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's kind of the reality of, of, of where the U.S. economy is at. It's pretty solid from a consumer standpoint. Uh, it's pretty solid with regard to uh, uh, imports. Uh, but if you look at the export sector, you look at business investment, it's pretty stagnant and so forth. And I think what we're looking at is a U.S. economy that is going to perform around the 2% level. Uh, that's really kind of the best we can hope for at this point in time, simply because we, like every other country, we have some major structural issues we need to address uh, in terms of immigration reform, in terms of health care, in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of tax policy, entitlement spending. All of those issues have been on the table for some time. That terminology, kicking the can down the road, we've been doing that now for four or eight years. Uh, we really have not come to any consensus politically or even I think in the American public with regard to where should we go with all these issues. Uh, until we can get that kind of leadership that takes us in some particular direction, I think we just kind of bump along at this 2% economy. So has that uncertainty, has it slowed our economic prospects? Oh, I think there's no doubt about it. And you can see that to some degree, we have pumped tremendous amount of liquidity into this economy, you know, with, the, with quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve, you know, balance sheets of these corporations are heavy with cash and so forth. Uh, there's a reason why this cash isn't getting deployed into new investments and so forth. And I think it's, it's this uncertainty with regard to the economic climate uh, and policy-wise that really limits the, how much of that money is, is going to spent for new activity. Now, we're seeing mergers, we're seeing stock buybacks. Uh, we're seeing some overseas investment and so forth, but by and large we're not seeing the kind of things that creates jobs and gives, gives us a dynamic economy and so forth. And I think we need to resolve these issues, One, you know, make a decision is, is kind of the theme that I have. Make a decision on these issues. The business community knows what to do once you have programs in place and you've made decisions. But if you can't tell me what you're going to do with immigration reform, you can't tell me what you're going to do with regard to regulation, what you're going to do with regard to health care policies, I'm in a quandary from the business standpoint how to deploy my capital. Now, if you would like to see my full conversation with Terry Barr, just head to okhorizon.com and look for it under our value-added section.